Good afternoon, everyone. And my official good afternoon uh, to everyone here and uh, to our virtual audience. Uh, we're here at the Anheuser-Busch Auditorium uh, at Cook Hall on the campus of St. Louis University. On behalf of our St. Louis Literary Awards Selection Committee, composed of members of the SLU faculty and the St. Louis community, the St. Louis University Campus Read Committee, our Alumni Development Department, the Office of the Provost, and the St. Louis University Libraries, I would like to welcome all of you to the 2021 St. Louis Literary Award Author Craft Talk, featuring this year's award recipient, Zadie Smith. Before we welcome uh, Zadie out here, I wanted to take uh, a couple of moments to tell you about the St. Louis Literary Award series of programs, which have been expanding each year, and all of them are free and open to the public. And some of those include the aforementioned Campus Read, which focuses on a specific book written by the current award recipient. This year it's Grand Union, uh, which is a collection of Zadie Smith's short stories that came out in 2019. And this also features book talks and lectures spread throughout the year. Now, this year we've got two, not one, so spread throughout the semester. So we've got um, three more book talks to go, uh, one in November and two more in December, connected to, uh, to Zadie Smith and her work. Our Campus Read Committee, by the way, features faculty and staff from 19 different departments from both here in the St. Louis uh, campus and on the Madrid campus. And by the way, if you have not yet re uh, read Grand Union, we still have copies available at the Pius Library. And those are free. The Undergraduate Writing Award, we rotate between fiction, creative nonfiction, and poetry, and poets, you're in luck. This is your year. You can still submit uh, a poem for this year's competition. Check it out online. We also sponsor the Walter J. On Graduate Research Award in the English Department. The Craft Talks at St. Louis University video audio podcast is a series where we interview writers, artists, and educators about their creative process and world perspectives. The Inspired by Art Showcase is open to both high school and college students around the region. All you have to do to possibly win a fabulous cash prize is to connect some form of literary, visual, or performance art to uh, some, uh, a theme in one of the Grand Union stories. You still have time to enter, by the way. That goes until December 10th. And we've got, I think, flyers out front if you want to check those out. Evenings from Home is a terrific lecture series that we've hosted since the early 1980s, connecting a writer uh, who has roots of some level here in Missouri. And the Literature and Medicine program is a series now in its 10th year. It explores the vocation of medicine and healthcare through the lens of literature, both fiction and nonfiction, and that's led by our English faculty. I wanted to also thank our team, and I know I'm forgetting people, but Dave, Patrick, Fran, Donna, Annalise, Claire, Tony, Tara, Nate, Tidy Projects, and of course the university libraries, faculty, and staff for being the backbone of all of our programs. And now a little bit of information about our guest today. Zadie Smith is the author of the novels White Teeth, Autograph Man, On Beauty, and W, and Swing Time, as well as three collections of essays, Changing My Mind, Feel Free, and most recently, Intimations. Professor Smith was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2002 and was listed as one of Granta's 20 best young British novelists in 2003 and again in 2013. White Teeth won multiple literary awards including the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, the Whitbread First Novel Award, and the Guardian First Book Award. On Beauty was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and won the Orange Prize for Fiction and N.W. was shortlisted for the Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction. Sadie Smith is currently a tenured professor of fiction at New York University and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Rachel Greenwald Smith is today's moderator, and she is the author of On Compromise, Art, Politics, and the Fate of an American Ideal, which just came out on Grey Wolf Press, and Affect and American Literature in the Age of Neoliberalism, and that comes, or came out on Cambridge University Press. She's an associate professor of English here at SLU, where she teaches courses at the graduate and undergraduate level on contemporary literature and critical theory. Everybody, please give a warm round of applause to Rachel Greenwald Smith and Zadie Smith.
Hi. Hello. Hey. hey. Can you hear me okay? I think we're okay. This way? That way? Better? Check, check. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, I wanted to start out, since this is a craft talk, and so ideally we're going to be talking about creativity, um, yeah. by asking you um, to talk a little bit about the ideas about creativity that we see in your most recent book of essays, Intimations. So um, in that book's opening essay, which is entitled Peonies, you talk about the relationship between experience and art. And um, you say that while most people consider writing to be a form of creativity, and here I'm quoting you, you say, writing is control, the part of the university in which I teach should, rather than the creative writing department, properly be called the controlling experience department. Um, so I'm wondering if you can say more about that distinction between creative and control, creativity and control and how it plays out in your writing. Um, I, I think it's just the way I think about language. Maybe, maybe it's the way I was educated. Like, at the moment, there seems to be a really different attitude towards language. Like, to me, I, I think of it as an innocence in front of language. Like, most people treat language like it's been handed down from Moses from the mount, and then they apply it to their lives and their experiences. I was always taught from a kind of phenomenological perspective that experience is this, like, absolutely unformed, uncategorizable thing, and language is exactly what you use to control it. It's not the truth, it's just a st structural thing that helps you categorize your life, but there's no truth to it. It's, po it's temporary and partial. And so for me, writers are, are the worst offenders of that. You know, they're the, they're the opposite of, um, you know, I don't know, a kind of pure indigenous spirit of experience. They're all about uh, structuring giving language, giving shape to what really has no shape, giving narrative arc to what has no narrative arc. Um, so to me, that's all an act of control and tends to be done by people who uh, like to be in control. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, so, and, and you of course teach, and we talked this morning with um, some members of the English department about your pedagogy and how you sort of prefer to teach literature rather than... It's a very grand word for what I do, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> With well, you. I'm going to ask you about it because it occurred to me that you know your invocation of the controlling experience, uh, controlling experience department sounds like a sort of curriculum initiative. What would the, <laughs> what, what would the curriculum of the controlling experience department look like if you were to run one? Um, I mean, the way I teach, I teach you know 14 novels every year. I've done that for almost 20 years, unbelievably. Um, and what I'm kind of trying to demonstrate to my students is, is um, the workings of rhetoric, like each of these novels is a kind of manipulation for the period that you're in this novel, you're seeing the world through, through this version, through this particular language. And when you notice that about novels, you start noticing it about everything, presumably. You stop being so innocent in front of rhetoric, whether it's political, general, internet language, whatever it is, psych psychiatric language. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about... Um, demonstrating to them that there's no such thing as a neutral language. It's always a uh, manipulation of, of one kind or another. The question is, uh, who do you want to be manipulated by? <laughs> and uh, I'm offering to them, you know, instead of Zuckerberg or Bezos or whoever, Dorsey, I'm offering them Toni Morrison, Tolstoy, Nabokov. Uh, but it, but it, it's a manipulation all the same. Yeah. Um, of course, this essay begins in a, is the beginning of a book that's largely about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think I found it very um, affecting the way you begin this book about the pandemic with a discussion of creativity and control, partly because it really spoke to me as a writer who also struggled to think about the role of writing during the pandemic. Right. Um, at the end of that essay, um, you say that COVID-19, and again, I'm quoting you, makes a nonsense of every line. So. I'm wondering how the pandemic affected your thinking about control and creativity, and also another word that comes up in that essay is submission. Um, you talk about the pandemic as sort of insisting on a kind of submission, and so... Right. I mean, I, I'm always interested in a, I think, sometimes slightly un-American way in limits, in human limits, mm -hmm. in, of time, of existence, the limits of language, the limits of art. So I, I've never had any grand 
um, ideas about writing. I've always thought of it as a limited art, and myself as a limited person doing a limited art. So it didn't really change that um, perspective, but it did, um, you know, in, in a world focused on utility, it did bring home even more intensely the, the non-utility of what I do. But also in a slightly, or maybe more American way, I do, I suppose, believe in souls and the idea of the need of souls. And, and that's my business, along with a lot of other artists, that we're in the kind of business of caring for that part that practical life doesn't allow for. You know, that whatever you want to call that, that existential part of our lives is what I'm concerned with. So I, it made me think even more intensely that that that's a vocation and one I'm, one I'm glad to be involved with. Yeah. I mean, in that sense, the book itself was a work of service in the sense that you donated the profits to nonprofit organizations working with COVID-19 and, and racial injustice, but also did you see it as sort of an act of service in terms of a sort of giving, giving something to people who are struggling in that moment? I, I, that makes it sound much more noble than it was. It's always <laughs> primarily selfish in that my mind was in tatters. It was like <laughs> on the floor. Okay. All I did was check COVID numbers and read the internet. And uh, normally, I, I'm like all of you, I mean, I read the internet a lot, but I'd never read it that much because I don't have the phone. And you're, normally, I'm not on my laptop every day doing that. I block the internet. I do all those things. But for the first time, I was fully in it, like I think most people are in it day and night. And uh, that was an interesting experiment. And what it revealed to me is that it's intolerable. And then I felt great admiration yeah. for all of you for doing that day and night. Like, it's unbelievable what you're doing <laughs> and the labor that you're doing, the unpaid labor, the emotional destruction, the psychological brutality of it. I was like, shit, this is what people are doing all day long. This is yeah. their life. So as a writer, that's like a, that's a really important thing to know. Like you can theorize and imagine what it's like, but for once I really knew what it was like. And I, and a lot of things became very clear, like the kind of writing I read every day, the kind of novels that come through my door, the kind of conversations I have with people under 30. I was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So then it was a kind of way of uh, like physician heal thyself. Like I really thought needed to remember that language can do other things than what it was doing. Um, and what it does online. Um, so it, it was just for me, first of all, primarily. Like, can I remember what it was like to feel that my consciousness was my own? And then I thought if I could do that and pass it on, and that's, that's actually been the happiest part of that book for me, that every now and then people will write to me and say, I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I couldn't concentrate. And I read those little essays, and I felt I could read again. And that's exactly what it did for me. So I'm glad if it did that for someone else. That's great. That knowledge of what digital experience is like of a certain kind, do you think that's going to come into your fiction in the future? Um, because you do handle technology in a kind of interesting way in swing time where the, the iPhone kind of frames the novel. Um, the I'm always writing about iPhone. it, but if you mean, am I gonna become Patricia Lockwood? No, because I don't think the purpose of, I mean, I, I admire what she's doing, but I, I don't feel any need to reinvent or repurpose in this ridiculously old-fashioned way what's happening online. I, I don't see, personally, I don't really see, see the purpose of that, even though I think it's incredibly useful news. Like, a writer like that is reporting to you, this is what consciousness feels like yeah. under this drug. So it's, it's news. Um, but that's not what I'm interested in doing because what I really want to remind people of what I think is a, a more radical and necessary move is to remind them that things were not always like this. The most toxic part of the situation is that it naturalizes itself. It pretends that there is no other way to be, there never has been any other way to be, this is the only existence possible, and that to me is not nature, that's ideology, mm -hmm. and particularly capitalist ideology. That's what it intends you to do, is to ensure that you feel there is no possible exit. And that crazy old lady on the stage talking about 
the disaster of iPhones is like, Where's, what's her problem? That is the whole purpose of this thing. No way out, no exit, never. But it's 2008, and I remember life before 2008, and a few people in the room will also remember it. Mm -hmm. um, and if I do nothing else for the next 30 years, I will continue to remind myself and remind others that it, life could be otherwise. You can have no radical action without the possibility of otherwise. That's great. Um, we have a couple of questions that were sent by some high school partners that were simulcasting this out to. And this one, to me, relates a little bit about what you were saying earlier about structure and control. Um, their, their question is, in your essay, That Crafty Feeling, you describe two types of writers, micromanagers and macro planners. Can you explain the terms and discuss why you see yourself as a micromanager rather than a macro planner? How are these two categories potentially helpful and instructive for young writers? I don't know if they are helpful. I mean, I, I was, <laughs> I, it was just what I was thinking about at the time, but yeah. I, I, all I meant is that I write line by line. I don't have a plot plan. I don't plan anything out. I, don't, I just write line by line in a very kind of minute way and ed edit each page as I go along. And, and it's clear to me that other writers work very differently. They have a kind of macro plan and they fill it in afterwards. Um, to me, there isn't anything apart from the sentence, and, but that's a very British thing and it can lead you into, um, uh, it, it, can, it can stop you from understanding what's good about a lot of other types of writing. Like writers I loved when I was a kid, like Martin Amis or these kind of high stylists in England, um, I, they are great writers, but they genuinely could not, would not be able to comprehend why, you know, I don't know, Nausgaard is good or Tao Lin is good. It, it, it would mean nothing to them because it, if all your attention is to the sentence or Sally Rooney, you can't comprehend what is good about these writers because it seems to you that these sentences are dull and boring or you can't understand what's good about Dostoevsky or, you know, or I, it, it, it's a... It's a kind of aesthetic battle, but I don't think that. I know what kind of writer I am, but I understand that writing can appear in different forms, you know. And the obsession with the sentence um, can be really limiting because it, aesthetic pleasure at the sentence level is not the only thing writing is for or about. That leads me to a question I have about style. Um, also sort of driven by a piece in Intimations titled The Hovering Young Man in which you talk about style by riffing on a line from Susan Sontag, style is a means of insisting upon something. And you say in the essay that you repeat that to your students a lot. Um, and so I was thinking about this in relation to your work um, and sort of the, what I think about as some of the stylistic properties of your novels. And one of the things that came to mind was sort of your use of narrative commentary, especially in your earlier work where you have a sort of third person novel or third person right. narrator who sort of comments on the characters. And even in a novel like Swing Time that's written in the first person, you still have this kind of self estrangement and ability to comment on characters. So I'm wondering, you can talk about that or some other element of your own style, but I'd be really curious to hear you talk about what you think you're insisting upon with those sort of stylistic tendencies or if that, I mean, it may not be something conscious, but um, if you can think back upon your white teeth self no, and imagine. It is con I mean, it's conscious in the sense that I, what I'm insisting upon is that the self is not everything, mm -hmm. that there are other demands in the world. Like, I understand that you feel like, I, I personally don't really feel like anybody, and I think that's quite a common trait of writers like me and comedians and actors, and, and I understand we are a minority concern. Like, I don't expect average citizens to walk around feeling like no one. That's clearly not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Um, but the fact is, there are people who feel that way. And we also have our rights. And our, our, <laughs> our right to feel like no one in particular, to belong to nothing in particular. So there, are, there is this weird psychological quirk of, of a certain kind of writer. And I, I wouldn't um, wish it on anyone. But perhaps what it, re it has little moments of revelation. Like I, when I see a group of people in a dark room going to see a comedy act, laughing, that's what they're getting. They're getting someone who is dissociated from themselves in a certain way and is able to laugh at themselves, deconstruct themselves, and, and the audience gets something from that. Even if they can't do it themselves, they see it and you get something from it. It's like a moment of freedom from this tyrannous self that you have to drag from place to place. So my prose, I think, is interested in that dissociation and what it might allow, you know? 
It might allow you sometimes to get over yourself, which is sometimes a significant and important thing to do in a, in a social environment, and to realize that alongside rights, which are incredibly important, there are also duties, and alongside self-identification, there's also the chance that your self-identification is not meaningful to everybody at all times. Basically, that you are not the center of the world. And this is a kind of consciousness that, um, for me, for like radical communal action is important. It's not that people aren't closely attached to their selves, but what I'm asking them is, does that close attachment have to exist at all times in all modes? Or are there times when you can release it a little bit and make space for the claims of other people and not take that as some kind of personal disaster for yourself? That relates a little bit to the sort of theme of solidarity that seems to come through the end of intimations. Right. And um, at the end of the book, you cite um, Muhammad Ali as sort of a figure for that sort of claim of solidarity, or as one of the inspiring right. forces for the claim of solidarity. Can you talk a little bit more about how that functions in your work? Do you think, are you writing solidarity narratives when you're writing? I grew up in, in a very, I think of an American situation, or maybe an older American situation which has been dispersed, with a group of poor people in a tower of many different backgrounds. So it's, it's not that the Indian family or the African family or the Caribbean family find themselves to have massive overlap, but they had this overlap of poverty. So it, it constructs in your mind an idea that it is possible to both state difference and state claims that are sometimes adjacent, but they don't have to be complete in order for things to happen. So all kinds of strange alliances, I mean, sometimes they're, you know, you can see it in my body, sometimes they're physical. The Jamaican marries the Englishman, or the Irishman marries the Pakistani, or the Polish Jew marries the African. So that is my neighborhood. There's obviously that kind of uh, intimate, I wouldn't even call it solidarity, because often these marriages end in divorce, but, uh, <laughs> you know, this kind of intimate uh, connection that happens. But there was also, um, in my child, the possible possibility of collaborative action. You marched for each other sometimes. Everybody came for the South African march, or the South Asians marched for the blacks, or the Jews marched for the blacks. We worked together um, uh, with no particular language for it. No one was walking around talking piously of allyship. You just thought, this is my neighbor, and here we go. Yeah. So that's the background that I came from. Um, in which there was a lot of mixing. And some of that mixing is, you know, painful and comic and ridiculous and uh, now has a language too, the microaggression. But I, again, when I'm writing, I'm not trying to reproduce sociological terms in fiction. I'm trying to talk about people's actual human lives. And I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I, I watch both the left and the right having elaborate rhetorical arguments about their particular political identities. But when you live amongst working people, this is really not what concerns them. What concerns them is, is there a school? Can I get health care? Is it free? These are the actual concerns of working people. I remember because I was one once and lived amongst them and grew up amongst them. And it's not that uh, your more rarefied political arguments don't matter, but to me, first principles come first, and those are to do with healthcare and education and housing. Those three things matter to me far more than what particular splinter of the left you choose to identify yourself with. And I think when I'm writing my fiction, that's what I'm thinking of primarily. How, how are streets arranged? How are people living? What does it mean? What does it mean to have a tall tower but rather than a low one? Was it mean to have a garden in the middle or a bare playground? Because those things, when I was a kid, were absolutely vital. They changed lives. The organization of a project changes lives. Civic planning changes lives. Those things are much more interesting to me than you know, whatever the argument of the day is online. So um, maybe asking that question a little bit more broadly, um, one of the things you say in intimations is that both that you think artists often overstate the political efficacy of art, but that you still believe in it. 
So I'm wondering if you could sort of broaden that out and talk a little bit about what you think novels can do politically or how you think novels touch on politics. I mean, my political consciousness is made from my life and the novels I've read, but it's not a direct recipe. You never know what book is going to change your mind or make you feel differently or reveal something. And the kind of, like I remember when I read recently, Edouard Louis, is now a good friend of mine, who's grew up white, French, extremely poor. Like if I ever thought I was poor, talking to Edouard is like a wake up call. <laughs> Completely different and much more extreme poverty. Gay in this nationalist extreme uh, country setting in France uh, where Paris was as far as the moon as far as he's concerned. Whereas I, no matter what my background, I was in London surrounded by culture and fancy people and interesting things to see. And Edward comes from the boondocks, completely different scenario. And sometimes the, if you assume the political efficacy of a certain book, you, you assume too much. You don't know who's going to make what connection. Well, I can remember 20 years ago sitting next to Toni Morrison, a great hero of mine, just but backstage and I tried to talk to her and she didn't want to talk to me. She, maybe she's in a bad mood or whatever. Or <laughs> just not interested in me, nothing. <laughs> Edouard wrote her a letter and said, you know, I, I love your books. And she said, come on over. And he spent like two days in her house. <laughs> I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> so you never know what, what connections people are going to make. You can't assume, you can't look at them and think, oh, well, Tony and Zadie are going to get on like a house on fire. Turns out, no, not according to her. <laughs> But Edward and Tony, yes. This skinny, gay, white boy from the middle of nowhere. And Tony Morrison had some kind of connection with each other. You can't pre-assume these things. Yeah. So that's how I feel about like, the political efficacy of books. It absolutely exists. But it cannot be... It's not diagrammatic. And all kinds of things can surprise you. I, I've learned as much from... You know, I just translated a... Chaucer. Chaucer is a 600-year-old, what people casually say these days, dead white guy. Like, that means something. <laughs> it's ridiculous. To me, literature is a huge lake, and nothing, is, um, nothing in it is inaccessible to me. Nothing doesn't have the possibility of being powerful. On beauty, in a certain sense, is about this, right? Um, I mean, I read that novel and think it's one of the better works of aesthetic theory of the recent past oh, in the sense that you, you seem to really deftly deal with these sort of more codified arguments about cultural appropriation and art um, and, and sort of, a, right. you know, culture wars on campus as well. It seems like but, a very relevant novel but now, But the important actually. thing is that those codified arguments change every 10 years. Sure. The young people don't realize that, but they just <laughs> flip. <laughs> So you can find Jim, James Baldwin saying, how dare you say that Tolstoy isn't mine, that the, the Chartres Cathedral isn't mine. These are all mine. That was the argument then. Don't you take this culture from me. I'm a human being. It's mine. Mozart is mine. And then 20 years later, it flips. And then it'll flip again. It, it's, if you don't read through the history of literature, you have no idea how these arguments go blim, 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 blim in black arguments, in white arguments, they're not permanent, and you will find yourself as, you know, the person who thinks they have the right set of arguments 30 years later, a dinosaur, completely incomprehensible to the 20-year-old in front of you. That is the way the history of ideas goes. So none of that surprises me, but, it, you know, it is almost comic sometimes to see arguments literally reversed um, within the span of 20 years. It's what happens. I don't really have a kind of judgment on it. I just am fascinated to watch it, watch it go. Yeah. So speaking of old arguments, um, your 2008 essay, uh, Two Paths for the Novel, has yeah. continued to have a lot of influence on contemporary literary studies. Um, and in that essay, and I'm not going to paraphrase it back to you, but a little bit for these folks here who may not have read it, you make a distinction between um, sort of the lyrical realism that you saw as sort of um, kind of paramount throughout maybe the past 100 years of literary history, 150 years of literary history, and you use um, Joseph O'Neill's Netherland as a sort of the, almost a self-parodying version of that tendency on the one hand, and then you talk about Tom McCarthy's Remainder, which is a very weird book, um, as sort of an alternative, which is a more sort of avant-garde or experimental path, and seem to claim that path as the path that you see as more productive in literary fiction going forward. 
Um, what do you think of that argument now? Do you still see these two paths for the novel, one sort of more lyrical, re sort of based on the history of realism, one more experimental? No, do you because see that's something the other else thing. Happening? Aesthetic arguments are temporal. They're about a certain moment. And even looking at those two writers, Joseph has gone on to write just the best <laughs> short fiction in America. Like, it's unbelievable, his stories at the moment. They've got this wildness and they're so funny and so dark, whereas Tom McCarthy is you know, increasingly anemic mm -hmm. and like stuck in a kind of series of intellectual spirals that don't allow in for the human. So there's always a, a gap and a blind spot. Like, I loved in that McCarthy novel the spirit of what you would call punk, right? Mm -hmm. Like, There's something wonderful about the spirit of punk, that it just wants to burn it down, destroy, strip it off. But then for me, there's always a but. Yeah. yeah, like as inconvenient and tedious as humans are, I always want to say to Tom, well, but here I am in my flesh bucket walking around the world, capable of pain, capable of loss. So, you know, it would be great if I was like a machine. The post-human is an interesting concept, but people suffer. Children suffer. Women suffer. Communities suffer. And suffering cannot be elided in my mind. So I, whenever you're making a kind of a provocation, a literary provocation, is always partial. What one argument could explain literature? It doesn't exist. But absolutely, at the time, I was just so tired of pretty novels and their pretty ideas, and, and also, I guess there was a very, there was a great strain of literature which was often about, you know, this kind of liberal situation of, why don't you read the novel, your empathy will increase, and then you'll be a better person. Mm -hmm. and and you kind of hope for that, and then these lovely people who all read these lovely novels and had really nice feelings about them grew up and sent their kids to the same private schools and moved into the same suburbs, and I was just like, well, what is the purpose of this activity? If nothing ever changes, like your empathy is, is enlarged, but you don't actually ever do anything. So you, I got a little impatient with that kind of literature, I suppose. Yeah, um, it was. it's interesting to think about what happened to your fiction since, because NW, which you were presumably working on at the time, yeah. did seem to be an experiment in some of those questions around interiority, and then Swing Time, your next novel, turned to the first person for the first time, and seemed to, at least by that turn to the first person, promise a different relationship to, the, to interiority. Did you see it that way, or what was, and I, I guess another version of that question might be, why the turn to the first person in Swing Time? What did that do for you? I was interested in a self that had no distinction. Like it was a very, it was the beginning of the social platforms and the thing about selves was that they had, they were very distinctive. They had opinions and they had feelings and they had a lot of them. And I thought, I don't, that's not how I feel when I'm walking through the world. I just don't feel that way. I don't feel very defined. I don't feel like I have, I feel like something to whom experience happens. It just keeps on coming and it's overwhelming, and I try and deal with it. But I, I couldn't tell you, if you said to me, what type of person are you? I really don't know, I couldn't tell you that. And I, th I thought, either I'm a freak, or, the, or this feeling is deeply disguised in people. But sometimes when I read other writers, like I just, I keep on talking about it. I just finished that book, O William, by Elizabeth Strout. It's about a woman married to a man for decades and decades and decades, divorced, and now spending a little time with him again. And even on the last page, she's like, who is this man? Like, who is he? And that is my experience of life. Like, I, people represent an enormous mystery to me. And I, I include myself in that mystery. Like, I know I walk around and perform things and act a certain way, but when I'm by myself in silence, it's very unclear who I am. And I think what's interesting about the phones is that it, they're really designed to never allow you any silence. So you never, when you have that moment, it's so easy just to grab the phone and be reassured because people are going to tell you who you are by their responses to you constantly. So you never get that moment where you just sit there, emptied out, silent, and just think, what is this? So f for me, swing time was about remembering a time where that silence existed and was possible and the slow encroaching of various kinds of technology, uh, primarily television, which is the one I grew up in, that took that silence and shaped it and curated it and told you, this is your life. Yeah. 
So we have some questions coming in from our remote audience. Hello, remote audience. Hey, remotes. Um, speaking of phones and such, um, one question is uh, notes. I mean, I, I'm going to add to this question and say that in both your writing and in person, you're very funny. Um, oh. And that um, this question is, what is the value of humor in fiction? Or more specifically, how do you value fiction in your, sorry, humor in your fiction? Why be it's, funny? It's a rhetorical way in. Like I've really noticed in America in the past, since 2016, the elevation of comedians to basically philosophers <laughs> because they're the only people left who are able to make arguments, make debate, provoke conversation through that little hole in you, humor, in which for a moment you are disarmed and able to listen, even listen to the possibility of a thought that isn't like yours. Mm. So it's really interesting to watch that happen. And then also, just as they've been appointed philosophers, they're also equally destroyed as philosophers, right? Because it's, what they're saying is so far from our usual discourse, which is basically just a series of uh, performances to each other, po-faced performances, or furious arguments. So comedy interests me that way. My brother's a comedian. I love comedy. Um, and I, I think, like philosophy, it asks, it's pauses from the average discourse and ask the very basic and most stupid questions. That's what's funny about it. That's why you're laughing, because nobody puts it so blankly and so simply. Usually there's much more sophistication over the top. So when I'm using comedy, I'm not aware of using it. I just, partly it's the way I see the world and partly it's a way of communicating with other people. Like before their defenses come up, um, if you can make them laugh, you've got them in a space where something might be able to happen. You know, they can think a bit more freely. They're not defending themselves. Um, I, I find that a useful spot. Real, this is related to relating to people. Another question from the audience. Um, this person says, I've heard you say before when talking about your books that you're most interested in knowing what the ordinary reader thinks. If that's still true, have you found ways of interacting with readers organically, especially outside academia? I meet them at signing tables. Sometimes mm -hmm. they stop me in the street or in airports. Or, and it's funny what, you know, um, I, I like to hear it, but there's only, this, this is, I guess, a difference between me and a lot of younger writers. Like, I, I'm always interested in life on a human scale. And it, it is on a human scale for someone in the street to, to stop you and talk about a book or for, Maybe you join a book club and five friends tell you what they thought of your story. What is not human is for 700 strangers to comment every second on, on, your, on something that you've written. That, that's yeah. not a reasonable thing. And what's so interesting to me is part of the, the trick of the social platforms is they convince really good and well-meaning people that it would not be responsible to know anything less than what everybody's thinking all the time. Yeah. And I think sometimes my students look back on, you know, poor people without internet like Socrates or Kant or early Alice Walker and think, what are, what are you doing? You don't, how could you write without understanding moment by moment what ex everybody thought of everything you wrote every second? So the, the space of privacy of the self, the space where you have a moment to actually reflect on what you want, because the model that they're dealing with is not actually liberatory or responsible. It's, it's focus groups. It's capitalist. Mm -hmm. It's, did you like this yogurt? Is it good? Should I change it? Should I do this? Should I do that? Would you like it strawberry flavored? Or, that's, that's not liberating. That's, that's about customers. And I don't think of my readers as customers. That's not the relationship that we're in. They are absolutely free to hate the books, to dislike them, to abuse them, to find everything in them disgusting, offensive, whatever. That is your right. You are a human being with your own opinions and feelings. It is also my right to write and not modify myself moment by moment because you don't like it. That is my right to. So this is another question from um, an audience member that relates to what you were just saying and, and um, touches on a question I have about generations and, and writers of different generations. Um, 
This question is, you acknowledge largely the influence that the late David Foster Wallace had on your writing and in your eulogy of him in Five Dials, write about the post-industrial bind of the need always to be liked, for yes. which Dave was in some sense freed by being awarded the MacArthur. I don't right. know. Have you personally experienced and found ways to overcome this bind in your own work? No, it, it's so funny that he's, he's so demonized now by this younger generation because he is their prophet. He described the bind mm -hmm. that they now live in day and night, wanting to be seen to be good, wanting to be seen to be right, wondering whether that is... I mean, the, the gap, I, I think there is a difference, that him and Franzen and everyone in that generation were worried in this almost Christian, moralistic way, if I do something good, am I only doing it because... I want to be seen to be good. Mm -hmm. That concern is gone. Yes. <laughs> Nobody's worried about that anymore. <laughs> Being seen to be good is the whole goddamn point. Yeah. So uh, that, that part has gone. But um, no, I, I, I'm born of it. I think it's from television. I think it's because we all grew up watching so much television that we had this completely phony idea of ourselves as basically on a TV show with an audience. And I think a lot of kids who grew up in the 70s and 80s had that very mistaken conception. It's, mm -hmm. it's existential, it was built into the tech. So the question for the younger generation is, what's built into your tech mm -hmm. that is d disturbing and how long will it last? Because I know the television delusion has lasted my whole life. And the metaphors of television like, uh, you see in my generation's TV products like X Factor or all that stuff or America's Got Talent, the idea of this is your moment, <laughs> that's a TV concept or that you could rewind and do it again, back to the future, or that there is a moment where your life changes. These are all TV metaphors that we took as, as reality. So that kind of stuff is super dangerous, and it infects your brain and your relationships and everything about it. So I, it's funny to me, because with my kids, even though I know all of that about television, when I was given the option with kids, do I give them the internet or TV? I absolutely gave them TV. <laughs> So my kids have watched all TV that exists in the human world <laughs> that has ever been made for children since, since they started making stuff for children. And I absolutely made that decision consciously. So generationally, you choose your poison, for sure. Because sure. I, I think with TV, I know what TV does. Delusional ideas of relationships, love, identity. I know all of it. I've lived it. I still prefer it. Mm -hmm. I still would take it over this, this other thing. And so maybe every generation makes their own choice along, you know, what's your poison? But uh, TV was mine, for sure. It's very helpful. I'm going to spend the next week thinking about how I've been poisoned by television. But, <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, relatedly, we're now beginning to see the influence of millennial authors on literary fiction. Um, so here I'm thinking about writers such as Sally Rooney, Brandon Taylor, Atessa Ates Mashveg, and Ocean Vong. But they're all older, you know. I mean, they are older. Millennials. I mean, yeah. so, right. I mean, it's funny because I was born in 1979, and so I, the question as to who's a millennial and right. who's a Generation Xer is, is a real question. I mean, my, Atessa seems 27, but she's 40. Right. Yeah. No, wait. She's 1980. I think she was born in 1981. So, oh, yeah, okay. so she's yeah, technically yeah. a millennial. She's just a right. You know, there's yeah. this. Uh, so uh, uh, the distinctions, of course, are really baggy. Um, but uh, a writer you've um, said is that you're a fan of Brett, Brett Easton Ellis recently said that millennials quote don't care about literature. None of them read books. No, he's <laughs> completely wrong, and oh. that's just not the case at all. And I, it's a bit, it's a bit depressing, Brits kind of grumpy old man um, <laughs> that has appeared. No, I, I love, he's such a great writer, it's, but it happens to all of us, and I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm along the path, right? I'm gonna be a grumpy old woman soon, so I, I can't judge. But um, I, I, the writing which actually really interests me is younger, it's the Zeds, can you mm -hmm. say that? And there was a publisher in New York called Tyrant Books, and unfortunately the, the editor just died of an overdose. But some of the stuff, that they published and that I found really interesting because to me, it, the millennials are, are still a bit stuck to our end and, and kind of a, uh, like they're making moral arguments or interested in what happened to us and what was this, what was the hipster or whatever, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But the Z kids are just report, it's just reported. It's just like, it's internet brain unfiltered. Mm. And some of those texts I thought are absolutely ex extraordinary. There's one called Internet Girl. I can't remember the name of the author, but I read about a year ago. And it's just a first-person account, kind of unpunctuated and 
completely, it feels insane to read, but what she's describing is what it was like to be, because I, I consider it, I am a moralist, and I do think a generation of parents, through no fault of their own, but because they were subsumed by this technology, it came over them like a wave, mm -hmm. did not notice what happened to their kids. Right. And those kids, this is, girl is describing what it was like to be, you know, four when the towers come down, and then you're, you know, you start online with the little games at about eight, nine, and then you're just fully in from then on in. And it is so shocking to read. And so without, like, um, she's not trying to make any argument on what she's just saying, this is how it was. If you're interested what it's like to watch, you know, endless amounts of hardcore porn aged 11, this is what it's like. And this is what it does to your brain. And this is, so this, it's just, it's just all there. And I think that, I mean, I, I am lucky because my kids are slightly younger and we're all much more aware. So it, it's not a, a question of, the only people I blame are the people who made it and knew. And I, I don't blame any individual because it's an overwhelming thing. But it did, it was amazing to read and amazing to think that someone could, could live through all that and still find a language for it. A really engaging, interesting language for it. And so that, I, I think, is the heroic in fiction, you know, when you can really uh, take something prepackaged and meant to flatten you out completely and refuse to be flattened, like still say, hi, I'm still here. Even if I'm like uh, a cyborg, here's my cyborg account. <laughs> and I really dig that. Do you see that as different than what someone like Lockwood is doing? I just think she's older. It's just completely different. It's, it's much more... She had more time, and she, from the background she came from, she had more time with her brain in a, in a very separate space. I'm talking about kids who... There is no other space. Yeah. They don't even know what you're talking about when you talk about some other space. So that, that's different. So an audience question asks... Um, what the future of the novel is and, liter and literary creativity given all the other media av available to young people today. Do you have an answer for I that? I have no idea. Like, I'm not really attached to the, I, 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 these kind of elegies for the novel or whatever. Mm. I, I never, they've been written forever and they don't interest me. I think, I guess I think more generationally, I think, I know I grew up in a generation who read and if only they follow me down to, our, if we all go to our graves together, that's okay with me. Like I, I, I'm very happy if people outside my generation read me, but I'm really talking to, to my people, like my time cohorts. And I like being with them and I like moving through the world with them. And, and if it all crashes and burns, it all crashes and burns. Like there are other ways to tell stories. That's fine. There's always been many ways to tell stories. I was listening to that. There's a great BBC series called History of the World in a Hundred Objects. And it's very um, humbling. Like, you can go hundreds and hundreds of, well, in one case, a, an object two million years old, like a stone that's been, you know, cracked so that it can kill an animal. That tells a story. Or a rain, it's, I think it's a reindeer horn that's been carved into the shape of two beasts. That's somebody telling a story, like an indigenous person hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago telling a story. The medium changes, and that's okay. And if the novel turns out to be a, a 20th century thing that dies in the 21st century, you know, other things will happen. So our high school partners have also asked that you speak about writing in different genres. So your most recent two books are both exercises in short forms, the essay and the short story. And it's interesting to me, actually, Intimations is a book of essays ostensibly, but you have those lovely little documentary sketches that almost feel like they're contiguous with short stories in some way. Um, so why the turn to shorter forms lately, and what do you think you've learned from working in shorter forms that you think you'll take with you into your novel writing? Um, a lot of it is, is really just practical. It's to do with being a woman with small children. Mm. I could never write those whatever they are, like 25 page chapters in On Beauty, I couldn't, I don't have that kind of time or focus or it's just, all my writing is done in the gaps. So it, it necessitates this 
kind of epigraphic form. And certainly with intimations, uh, that was, a, you know, a genuine negotiation between me and the other writer in the house. There's only a certain amount of hours in the day, and there's two small children, so there, it was never going to be anything but small. Um, but all restrictions are aesthetically useful, and it's, it's just wonderful to jettison what was too much anyway in my prose. And so uh, it, I absolutely took that lesson into the novel, yeah. The, I just see with clarity, like I never did when I was young, what I don't need to do. That's the best way I can put it. I just, it's just so much stuff I don't do anymore. It just, it just fallen away. And uh, even though it's a Victorian novel and it should feel like a big baggy monster, it's, it's, um, I, probably maybe it will end up long, but the bits of it are small. Like I'm really interested in these small sections and how little you have to do, in fact, to get to the heart of things. Aside from the length of the chapters, what else has fallen away? Oh, there's just, I mean, I think it's from reading Tolstoy again. Like you don't, if you're doing things right, no dialogue needs an, uh, no, you don't need to say to any reader, she said this, you know, tartly or strongly or like, if you write good dialogue, the reader will know. Everything, all bad writing is basically hand-holding. It's like anxiety and terror on the part of the writer that something isn't getting across. So you just, you don't really need metaphors, you don't need similes, you don't really need that many objects. You, what you need is clarity. And it all kind of falls away after a while. It's not that I, I'm hating on metaphor, but I, I, it's very rare that I find the need to say something is like something else. I'm just much more interested in the thing in itself and trying to convey it in language as directly as possible. Did you have that interest in clarity as a younger writer, or is that something you think has no, developed over time? It developed over time. Just, and maybe it's urgency of, as you get older, you really, really want to get the thing across. And also the numinosity of the world begins to overwhelm you. Like, there's no need to compare anything to anything else. It's just so beautiful and, and complicated in itself. And you learn lessons, like Rooney, is a, Sally Rooney is a good friend of mine, and I love reading those books, and one of the gifts she has, that she's always had, is exactly that clarity of vision, you know particularly in the last book, there's so many beautiful pages that are just saying what's there, knowing that that's enough, is, is a very unusual thing in a young writer to understand or to know. And she does get criticized for her sentences. A anyone who does that doesn't know what <laughs> writing is. It's so stupid, I can't even, it's not something I can even contend with, yeah. Um, can you talk about the distinction between fiction and nonfiction? Um, and I guess this question uh, for me does come from that little bit in intimations, those, um, those little bit softer burger. Um, so it's a distinction that seems like it's a little bit blurry in your recent work. It's certainly a distinction that um, has been sort of elevated into this discussion of autofiction lately, which I know I heard a little bit of an interview you did with Jennifer Egan in which you t said that, that you thought that that was a dumb ideology, and I tend to agree with it. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a conversation people are having right yeah. now. Um, and so I'm wondering about the distinction between nonfiction and nonfiction for you, sort of theoretically, and then also how it happens in your work, sort of how you decide what goes into fiction and how you decide what goes into nonfiction. I mean, I don't... <sighs> I don't really, it doesn't really mean anything to me, to be honest. Maybe that makes me a terrible person, but I believe in journalism. I would call that nonfiction. Yeah. By journalism, I mean going out, reporting on the facts of a situation <laughs> as far as you can discern them and interviewing people and uh, gathering information. I absolutely believe in that. That's what I would call nonfiction. But in literary world, nonfiction is not a thing that I conceive of. It's just writing. Are you imagining when people write their non-fiction essays or their memoirs about their life that they're telling some ultimate truth? To me, this is like genuinely delusional. <laughs> it's just rhetoric. It's just a different form. It's the rhetoric of I instead of the rhetoric of she, he. It's got nothing to do with truth. So I can't, I can't take it seriously, no, to be honest. I know that people feel, they must feel that they're telling 
the truth of their lives when they write autobiographies, but I would say ask their sibling or <laughs> ask their aunt if this was the truth. There's no such category when it comes to talking about people's lives. There's only what you remember, what you choose to remember, what matters to you, what emotionally is meaningful to you, but there's no truth in that racket. Are there novels of yours that have been more or less autobiographical? They're all autobiographical in the, in the sense that I, I am the raw material, but autobiographical in the narrow sense, I think I have just a different sense of what people mean by a self. Like when I, right, right now, it's 1830, how could it be autobiographical? Half the people at the moment are white before I get into Jamaica. Like none of these people have anything to do with me, supposedly, if you think that selves are easily identified by looking at them immediately and saying, well, that person doesn't have anything to do with you. But if I'm writing, you know, the 70 year old man walking down the street in London, 1830, some part of me is in there. When I'm tired, I feel 70 sometimes. When I wear a certain outfit, I feel mannish sometimes. <laughs> These are all inside me. They're not physical, permanent identities, but they exist. Sometimes I feel female, sometimes I feel male, sometimes I feel black, sometimes I feel white, sometimes I feel tall, sometimes it depends. I think a lot of people have these feelings inside them. They're unexpressible in our social lives because it's outrageous to say, sometimes you feel male. What do you mean by that? In, but fiction is the one place where I, have to, I could admit the truth of it. You know, if I'm walking down the street with big earphones on and big jeans, I can feel like a 15-year-old boy sometimes. I'm a 46-year-old woman. Well, how can that be true? It's not true in the sense that identities need to be true in order to perform political actions, or, but it is existentially true. And I think people know it to be true. They feel it inside themselves, but they don't know how to say it because it sounds outrageous. How can you possibly claim the identity of the other? But that's not what it means. I'm not claiming anything I just all these threads are inside me so when I'm writing I just pick one out and there you go and then you flesh it out with all your experience of seeing people knowing people hearing people the, the fact is that you are constantly um, you know in all your emotional relationships appropriating in some way you always are doing that. In order to imagine what your child feels, you've appropriated their feelings. In order to imagine what your wife or husband or boyfriend, you've made this leap into the other. You've made some guess. Usually you're wrong. That's what causes huge domestic arguments day and night. <laughs> but the, you're always making these guesses. That's what social life consists of. And the person who couldn't make the guess, who could never in a million years imagine what their girlfriend or son or aunt, or that person would be someone you could not have a relationship with. Relationality depends on making these guesses. And they don't have to be lethal. They can be playful, fun, comic, interesting. Sometimes they are painful, sometimes they are oppressive. Sometimes in the case of stereotype, they are deadening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in our political lives, they are literally lethal. But I am talking about a novel in which that playfulness, which is in all of, within all of us, might perhaps be allowed the possibility of existence. We have time for one more question, and I want to ask you before we go about place. Um, you lived in New York for a decade, over a decade maybe, um, and you're now back in, are you back in London? Yeah. Um, so, and elsewhere you've talked about, I think last night actually you mentioned that you thought writing, you think of writing in the first person as sort of an American trait in fiction or that you encountered it I've first. I've certainly picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is sort of my question. I'm wondering, you know, even if you are planning on leaving the States, do you think of yourself in any way as an American author now, having spent so much time here, having written so much about New York and about the U.S.? Are, uh, you know? Yes. I love America. I don't know why I love it so much. I can't. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. I disapprove of so much of it, and yet <laughs> I think it's what everybody says who comes to America. There's this like, uh, well, freedom is the word, right? But the freedom is both exhilarating and lethal. It is, as I've always said in my mind, like freedom to do anything, but also freedom to die in the streets. It's a, it's a lethal kind of freedom, and it's terrifying a lot of the time. But to pretend it isn't, real is, is a pretense too far. I don't even mean freedom has such a positive sense in America, and I don't really mean it that way. I mean that there is a lack of limit here, which is sometimes 
thrilling and sometimes genuinely terrifying. Like, I, it scares me. It always scared me living here, that I didn't know where the boundary would ever end in both people's sense of themselves, of what they think is possible in human life, um, of what, li what liberties they think they are allowed. All of those things are frightening to me. And yet, if you come from old Europe, there is always some excitement to it. And I guess to be released from some version of class that I had lived, been born and bred in in America and opened out into, into black America, into this idea of a huge community in which I could play some role or some part, that was a big part of the attraction. I, I had never, I went from a place where race was not spoken or people tried hard not to smoke, speak it because it was impolite to a place where no one ever stopped speaking about it. And it was a kind of liberation in a way. But even then, I was always, there was always a resistance, like, uh, because I come from a different part of the diaspora. I come from the Caribbean and from England. So I never, even though I was always fascinated by race, the American conception of race, I could never concede to it entirely. Because that would be con to concede to the idea that American life is universal life. And I just can't do that. I can't concede to American imperialism because when you go, when you travel and you end up in the tiny village in Gambia or the little place in Norway or and you meet black people of all sorts, you can't concede to America's version because it, it's parochial and it's yours. I, I respect it, I listen to it, I try and learn from it, but I, I will not accept it as my own, no. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you all.